All right. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. I'm delighted to have everyone join us for this session, panelists, guests. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm Martha Lincoln. I'm assistant professor of anthropology, and I'm the departmental advisor for internships, scholarships, and careers. And I'd like to begin with our university's land acknowledgement. The campuses of San Francisco State University on the San Francisco Peninsula and in the North Bay are located within the occupied unceded territories of the Ramaytush Ohlone and the coastal Miwok, who along with the Southern Pomo are organized as the Federated Indians of Grayton Rancheria. Every semester, our department organizes a special event to discuss careers in anthropology. And we invite speakers from a wide range of professional specializations to share their expertise with students. In the past, we've had practicing anthropologists who work in industry and in the private sector in non-governmental organizations. And we've also had our alums come back and join us. We've had um, an officer from the Centers for Disease Control. And I'm particularly excited to be presenting this session on activism and advocacy in anthropology careers because San Francisco State is known for its commitments to activism and social justice. And many of our students in the anthropology department share these values. But I know that many of you are also likely wondering how and whether you'll be able to put those values into practice after you graduate and join the workforce full time. There is really, I think, good news about that because it is possible to find professional opportunities that will make use of your skills in anthropology directly and also help make the world and your communities a better place. It's totally possible. So this conversation is convened today to share the experience of some experts, national experts who have done remarkable work drawing connections between their social justice concerns mm -hmm. and their expert knowledge in cultural, visual, and medical anthropology, as well as archaeology. We're very honored to have them sharing with us. So I would like to introduce each of them briefly. Their accomplishments are remarkable. So I will be giving you just a snip on each of our five speakers. Um, please see the event flyer for fuller information about all of the activities that they are individually doing. We will then hear from each panelist for about 10 minutes and plan on transitioning to your questions at about 2.30 p.m. or 5.30 p.m. Eastern. All of our speakers, I believe, are in Eastern time today. I uh, know Central, Dr. Bjork James. Let me start by telling you a bit about Dr. Bjork James. Um, he is the author of The Sovereign Street, Making Revolution in Urban Bolivia, published last year by the University of Arizona Press. He conducts immersive and historical research on disruptive protest, environmental struggles, state violence, and indigenous collective rights in Bolivia. Dr. Bjork James's work draws on his experience as an environmental and human rights advocate and as a participant in direct action protest movements. I might add that Carwell and I attended the same PhD program, the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. We have been friends and colleagues now for over a decade. So honored to have you with us today. Dr. Raymond Codrington is the president and CEO of Weeksville Heritage Center, an historic site and cultural center in central Brooklyn that uses education, arts, and a social justice lens to preserve, document, and inspire engagement with the history of Weeksville, one of the largest free Black communities in pre-Civil War America. He's a cultural anthropologist and an expert in creating intersections between popular culture and race studies, museum and public engagement, policy analysis, and applied research. Before joining Weeksville, Raymond was the executive director of High Arts in New York City, among his other activities, Raymond has developed programming focused on urban expressive culture for the LA Department of Cultural Affairs and the Mayor's Office of Los Angeles as an independent curator and consultant. Dr. Donna Davis is professor of urban studies at Queens College and is also on the faculty of the PhD programs in anthropology and critical psychology at um, CUNY Graduate Center. 
Um, she's a cultural and a medical anthropologist, presently serving her second term as the director of the Center for the Study of Women and Society at the Graduate Center. Dr. Davis's work covers two broad domains, Black feminist ethnography and the dynamics of race and racism. Her most recent book, Reproductive Injustice, Racism, Pregnancy, and Premature Birth, was published by NYU Press. Davis has served as co-chair of NARAL New York, was the coordinator of the Reproductive Rights Education Project at Hunter College, and has consulted with the National Network of Abortion Fund. In lieu of receiving an honorarium for her time with us today, Dr. Davis is donating copies of her book to our students, and we are extremely grateful for her generosity. Dr. Harjant S. Gill is Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice at Towson University in Maryland. His research examines the intersections of masculinity, modernity, transnational migration, and popular culture in India. Dr. Gill is also an award-winning award filmmaker and has made ethnographic films that have screened at international film festivals. Among many distinguished fellowships and awards, Dr. Gill recently received the Whiting Foundation Public Engagement Fellowship. He is currently developing a virtual reality web series on Indian masculinities called Tales from Macho Land. Dr. Gill is an alum of San Francisco State's program in visual anthropology. Welcome back. Dr. Alexandra Jones is the executive director, founder, and CEO of Archaeology in the Community and a professor of practice at Goucher College, which coincidentally is also in Towson, Maryland. Dr. Jones has been an educator for more than 16 years. She has taught in educational environments from primary school to museums and is an education leader focused on community outreach. Dr. Jones worked for PBS's television show Time Team America as the archaeology field school director where she directed field schools for junior high and high school students at each of the sites for the 2013 season. She serves as the president elect for the Society of Black Archaeologists and is among other distinguished service, also an academic trustee for the Archaeological Institute of America. So welcome all. We're so delighted and honored to have you here. I would suggest that we transition to presentations maybe in the same order of speakers. So. Dr. Bjork James, if you're ready to share. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I too want to begin by um, acknowledging that uh, Nashville and Vanderbilt University occupy the ancestral hunting and traditional lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek peoples. Today, these peoples have nation boundaries in Oklahoma, North Carolina, and Mississippi after the Indian Removal Act of 1830 led to their forced removal from uh, lands uh, forced removal to lands west of the Mississippi River. Um, and let me share my screen. Okay. So I'm also um, really delighted to be joining uh, folks at San Francisco State because uh, San Francisco played um, an important role um, in my life. I lived in the Bay Area um, from 1999 until 2006 um, and sporadically since then. Um, and my first uh, long distance admiration for the movements of Bolivia, which I'll be talking about today, um, really began during that period um, in uh, sometimes organizing directly in solidarity with them and sometimes organizing um, in ways that were inspired by um, grassroots movements across the global south, but of which um, Bolivia is um, a really a standout example. Um, so I want to um, briefly kind of go through how the questions that have come up for me um, as an ethnographer um, then bleed over into um, acts of um, what I'm calling apprenticeship, uh, witness, um, and ally work. Uh, and so um, apprenticeship in the sense of uh, following the ways and learning from the ways that people organize and people conceptualize their collective actions um, in ways that I think can inform the movements that uh, I have been a part of and hopefully other movements that uh, have inter overlaps of affinity, uh, perspective, and identity. Um, and then secondly, to talk about uh, witness work around um, the consequences of uh, lethal state violence um, and bringing organizing information about that um, and all and also about uh, ally work in those moments where um, 
uh, movements are facing challenges are in need of solidarity and um, the ability to use situated knowledge, right, to contribute to uh, a process of international solidarity. Okay, so um, Bolivia consistently ranks as um, one, of the, one of the most politically engaged countries on earth uh, in terms of participation in popular protest. Um, surveys come up with these numbers of lifetime protest participation, uh, upwards of 35%, sometimes upwards of 60% amongst adults, which is um, huge. Um, and uh, you know, places Bolivia in the top three um, of countries on such surveys, um, the frequency of protests and their disruptive character in Bolivia um, is um, at an extreme for Latin America, which is already um, often a, a very active place um, for protest. Um, however, um, protest and movement participation in Bolivia are also sometimes dangerous um, and involve encounters with security forces, involve um, situations in which um, there is risk involved in protest and involve tactics of protest um, that um, either uh, produce or sometimes invite confrontation right, with the state. Um, so um, what my work is focused on is how did those um, movements um, lead to vast transformative effects, um, but that also involves asking a series of questions about this experience, including um, how do we understand the exceptional risks, exceptional risks and actions um, taken by Bolivian protesters? Um, how can I understand, in, you know, in the example of this image here, um, why are these people, uh, why, how have these people use stones to blockade um, a major road? Um, how do blockades get organized? How do they accumulate into um, a force that can influence state policy? Um, and also, how do I understand the kinds of um, risks that people take in the place that um, both uh, combativeness and suffering, right, play um, in, the, in their movement narratives. Um, and on the other side, how do we understand um, the power and limits of state violence and what, what are the situations in which um, violent force is able to or disarticulate movements and what are the ways that movements are able to um, hold together, right, um, and hold people accountable uh, for those things. So those questions are percolating right through um, a lot of a lot of my research. Um, I wanted to highlight the ways that um, so because my my first conceptual arena right is thinking about this engagement as um, apprenticeship right understanding that my writing um, Bolivians by and large know how their social movements function. Um, and in, in fact, like there's a lot of collective awareness about um, in terms of expectations uh, um, around working together, um, ways of pressuring and so on. Um, and also, um, so then a lot of my writing is intended um, for a North American audience to be able to think about um, the process of space claiming protest, um, the process of uh, mass collective organization. Um, and hello. I pushed it. Uh, can you ask it in 10 minutes? No. I think you can. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me finish my sentence. Um, how to think about, um, in, in particular, the ways that people uh, organize their, their movements, um, have um, hor both horizontal and vertical systems of accountability, um, which is a thing that I've seen functioning in a kind of exemplary way in Bolivia. I think we can learn a lot from um, how they can um, how they manage to, um, instead of debating about tactics, um, overlap um, and go beyond the dichotomy between violence and nonviolence, um, and uh, separately to figure out how to draw on movement voices um, to really give people uh, like an in-person and up-close um, look at the ways that uh, movements are acting. How can I help you, Clay? I need you to have me pat. Um, I cannot do that right now, but I'm sure your grandma can. She's watching something with Talia. You can make that work. Ask her. Ask her. Nah. Prepare yourself. Nah. Nope. Okay. I'm okay. 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 Um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, so, um, uh, so that work. Um, has and the engagement of social movements has been like indirect, right? Has been one of thinking about how can the people from the many grassroots social movements and in particular the like uh, direct action and racial justice movements that I, I came out of and found, my, found myself engaged here in North America um, benefit from the experiences and, and wisdom of um, you know our, our comrades um, in Bolivia. Um, on a second 
um, round um, is that in the process of doing that, I found myself um, you know, amidst different crises, right? Um, and this March in 2011 is representative of a moment when um, you know, a very transformative left government in Bolivia was being challenged by um, you know, in, in some ways equally transformative grassroots indigenous movement um, over questions of territory and sovereignty and environmental protection. Um, and this is a, it's really essential for us to have um, you know, a clear-sighted, um, multiply engaged set of people um, and ethnographers often play this role who are able to talk through like what are the details of these conflicts that happen um, amongst progressive forces um, in, situa um, in situations like this one. So I won't go too much into the Tigris conflict um, and I'll kind of cede these seconds uh, to my daughter uh, but go on to talking about um, uh, my other role as a data collector around uh, violence in uh, and around state violence in particular. Um, so this is Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada um, at his trial in the United States, uh, a federal court civil trial um, that happened two years ago um, to uh, attempt to hold him accountable for an event called the gas war um, in which um, under his under his leadership, um, soldiers killed upwards of 58 people um, during a two month conflict over gas privatization. Um, so one of the ways that I've worked to engage with that um, is to build a database, which is called Ultimate Consequences um, of Deaths um, in Bolivian protests um, during the entire democratic period. So since 1982. Um, so this has been a, a sort of long term and large scale like qualitative and quantitative data collection project. Um, most of it, you know, using drawing a lot of different kinds of sources um, and then creating some analytical tools to search through um, and understand um, this uh, trove of data, right? Um, so for instance, this is a like live interactive uh, table that allows you to look at all the major events um, of which this gas war in two, September and October 2003 um, was the largest and deadliest. Um, and I was able to, um, bring this information into an expert uh, report that was presented to um, that trial. Um, and in particular, make this overall claim that if we look across this time um, in the democratic period um, and see the kinds of uh, levels of state violence um, that were involved, that there's this you know, quantitative outlier that's represented by um, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada's crackdowns in February and in September, October of 2003. Um, and also look at that in terms of the political culture um, of um, Bolivian society, the place that disruptive protest plays as a form of democratic participation, um, and to look at the, you know, this like really exceptional period in terms of um, the degree of state perpetration of death, um, and to quantitatively compare it, right, um, to talk through the ways that, um, you know, the Sanchez de Lozada administration stands out in terms of its use of state force. Um, and then lastly, um, I want to talk about this problem or like the application of engaged um, knowledge and this kind of data collection to real-time political crises. So as you may know, um, Bolivia went into a major political crisis in 2019 with op um, opposition protests across the country um, that spiraled into a police and military coup uh, November, um, consummated on November 10th, uh, 2019. Um, and so thinking through how, um, this kind of both situated knowledge of what's going on and ability to sort out different kinds of protests in a very complex moment, um, and also the ability to communicate um, what was going on during the, you know, the aftermath of this coup in which we had these two major massacres at Sacaba and Zacata, um, and already to be engaged in this, this process around uh, human rights witnessing and documentation um, is something that um, was a I, I think inescapable part of my work at that moment um, and something that um, I'm now trying to figure out like what are both like the intellectual products of that and the ways that um, you know in these moments I was I felt like I was mass communicating um, what exactly was going on in Bolivia working doing press work in the background and also um, you know pre-coding all of this information so that at some future point um, we can put into the same kind of perspective um, the crimes of of this government um, uh, that took power then and fortunately was uh, voted out um, in uh, October of 2020 after um, mass protests insisted that that vote be held promptly. Um, so um, there's a lot of different kinds of engagement that are, are represented, um, but I feel like um, 
you know, one ends up um, going back and forth from the line of like uh, distance scholarship, apprenticeship, uh, lobby, uh, lobbying and mass communication to um, activists and others, um, you know, creating and writing open letters, um, showing up for um, different movements and allowing them to um, find ways of connecting to people who are distant from them. Um, and I think all of those are, you know, essential parts of, um, you know, being a politically and ethically honest person who cares a lot about what's going on on the ground around you when you're doing ethnography. Um, so here's my contact information and thank you. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Carwell. We might now turn to Dr. Codrington. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, we are on Lenape land and um, we are surrounded by our ancestors who went before us as part of Weeksville Heritage Center. Um, Weeksville Heritage Center is an historic site. It's about 1.5 acres in central Brooklyn and Crown Heights. And it houses the remnants of four historic homes called the Hunter Fly Road Homes. And they're the last, I call them the extant, um, old but in good, in old but in good uh, condition houses that really um, personify the spirit of Weeksville and actually are the physical remainder of the community. Weeksville was started in 1838 as a free black community by a person named James Weeks. And the idea was to give black, free blacks, or um, yeah, free black people, the right to vote based on property ownership. So at this time, if you were a male above 21 years old and you owned land above 250, um, uh, $250, sorry, 25 years old and above 221 years old, and you owned, owned land that was valued above $250, you have the right to vote. And so it was a very deliberate act to allow formerly enslaved and free Blacks not only property ownership, but also the opportunity to participate fully in terms of citizenship. So Weeksville as a community has always had its roots in um, notions of resistance, resilience, resilience, um, it built its own institutions, schools, churches, um, mutual aid societies, orphanage, um, orphanages, orphanages, um, homes for the aged. So really, you know, what we sit on right now, where I am, um, we try to uphold those values and those notions about black self-empowerment, entrepreneurship, self-determination, freedom, resistance, and resilience. And for me as an anthropologist, I started out in museums, um, started out at the Field Museum in Chicago many moons ago on a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, anthropologist named Ala Kowali, who at the time had a center called the Center for Cultural Understanding and Change and really introduced me to the ways that which anthropology can operate um, in a museum and make the connections between museums and communities. So what's novel about the Center for Cultural Understanding and Change was that it was an urban anthropology sort of unit and a broader anthropology department. When you're in an anthropology department in a museum, you're probably going to be surrounded by um, archaeologists. Nothing against archaeologists. I know we have some archaeologists um, in, in the room, so I shot, shot you all out. But, I was, but you know, you, <laughs> there weren't that many cultural anthropologists, and there really weren't any at the time. I can't remember any cultural anthropologists doing urban anthropology work at museums as part of a unit, a research unit. So um, that really allowed me to stretch the idea about sort of what, anthrop what, what anthropology can do in a non-academic, quote unquote, non-university non setting. So when I was there, um, I, I, and this is, I think, part of the idea about sort of activism and how do you create social change or how do you put yourself in positions where social change, you can be linked to social change efforts or groups. Um, you know, at the Field Museum, Alika, the person that ran CCUC really opened up space. And I think that's probably one of the biggest, um, I think things that was done for me in terms of facilitating any kind of idea about how social change can work is really to create space and openings. Um, informally, we call it running interference, <laughs> but it was really about creating space, creating space to do different kinds of work. Um, so when I was there actually, we're talking about social change and I kind of convened <laughs> a hip hop, um, the international hip hop, conference called Hip Hop, uh, yeah, Hip Hop and Social Change. I think it was called Hip Hop and Social Change, uh, the new agenda for the, for the 21st century or something like that, where we convened artists, activists, intellectuals from Chile, 
Brazil, Germany, Tanzania, um, the US to really talk about. So what's the inter intersection between it? Um, hip hop, organizing and activism and looking at this from an academic uh, practice um, and as well as activist perspective, we convened this over several days. And it really opened my eyes to see that, you know, it's kind of those things where you build it, they will come. So Field Museum built in 1890, I believe. And uh, it has a big Greco Roman, Roman architecture. Actually, you cut me off and my 10 minutes is up. Um, and, you know, I was there. I was one of a few people, of, I think I, I was a postdoc and there was only one other person of, of African descent that was there. I'd been on staff in something that was a, a decades. So, you know, when we did the conference, we, ought to, we saw that different kind of programming brought different kinds of people to the museum. But the question was, how do you um, maintain those audiences? How do you maintain connections? How do you build relationships with the groups that you, that you worked with around the conference and the programming? So for me, I've been, since then, um, one, thinking about ways to create opportunities for people that have um, either different research agendas, um, different artistic practices, different, um, you know, different ways of approaching that work, space and institutions, whether that be at the Field Museum at that time by bringing in colleagues that were in, in the culture, doing the work, organizing on the ground, or in my current role now as, as president and CEO, um, there are any number of ways that, you know, when I think about my work, I don't necessarily think about it in terms of um, activism or, or social change. One is because now, I mean, Weeksville is, it's kind of what we do historically, and we don't, we don't, we can't get away from that because that's what really got us here. Um, you know, the Hunter Fly houses are they were rediscovered in 1968, and a nonprofit was built around them. But it was a community effort that really one got those houses landmarked, um, helped build the nonprofit, and then in 2014 we had we had an um, arts and culture building uh, built. So from the beginning of Weeksville in 1838 to the rediscovery of, of the houses in 1968, to really most recently, um, you know, we had a big community effort around getting us what was called CIG status. So um, Weeksville is part of one of 34 institutions in the city of New York that received direct funding from the city. Um, so these are the Lincoln centers, the Mets, um, not, the, not, the, not, the, not, the, not the baseball team, the, Metro, the Metropolitan Museum, um, you know, the aquariums, the Seuss Natural Museum, so Studio Museum in Harlem. So now you, we receive funding from the city and this is guaranteed for the year, it's called baseline funding. And, that, and, and for us to get a C, the CIG status again, that was a community effort. So, you know, one thing is thinking about what is the relationship between cultural institutions and communities and how do we leverage um, the power of organizers, the power of artists, the power of funders, um, you know, staff really to build a different kind of profile for an institution like ours that is in, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a neighborhood, we're in the middle of Crown Heights. Um, I'm here now looking out the window, directly across the street is a public housing development that was built in 1941. Um, in oddly, not oddly, but interestingly enough, on that, in that housing unit, in the public housing unit is an art freeze piece that is from the 1950s called um, Exodus and Dance by a, an artist named Barthes. Um, and it's really interesting because for me, I see this, first of all, it's my dream job, but I see this as an opportunity to really think about what as an institution can we do as an organization that's embedded in a community? How do we build better relationships? How do we help people rethink the role of cultural institutions and cities? And how do we leverage our resources so that we can create programs that people that live in this neighborhood can see themselves represented in the work that we do? Um, interestingly, for cultural institutions, many of them, um, you know, the idea about access and diversity and equity, I mean, it's, it's in the ether now. It's, you can't really go anywhere without having these discussions. Some are informed, some are horrible. But for us, you know, one of the things that, that we've really taken up is, you know, as an institution that's steeped in a history of, kind of emancipation, abolition, freedom, um, black self-empowerment, really what does that mean moving forward? Historically, 
you know, we've been steeped in those values, we're steeped in that history, but then what does this history mean moving forward? And how are we gonna be an institution that can house, you know, or can, can address particular kinds of conversations, especially in the moment post, post, well, post George Floyd, um, you know, people are looking at us to really be able to have conversations, facilitate relationships, develop art that really reflects the political and social and cultural moment. So for us as an institution, it's a really exciting time. And for me, I'm sort of sitting here thinking, you know, how much or how deeply can we as an organization really engage notions around social change and activism? Um, you know, as a leader of an organization, you know, we can create space, but then what are the implications of that for, you know, very, very material implications for our funding, um, for our, for our audience, audience ship, um, for the profile of the organization in, in the broader neighborhood. So these are the kind of issues that, that I deal with on, on an everyday basis, um, you know, because there's a different level of accountability for us. When we're a black institution, um, for, for the most part, predominantly black institution in, in a predominantly black neighborhood. Um, there's been a, a large degree of community engagement, community support for us, and there's a high degree of accountability. So if people, if we're not getting it right, if we're not talking about the right issues and we're not framing in the right way, people tell us. So when I started, um, you know, I had people for the first month knocking on the door of the museum of, of, um, of the building saying, hey, where's Raymond? We saw him. I had to do a bunch of press. Some in, pre in the paper, some on TV, we want to meet him. These are community members coming up because they have a very strong sense of ownership and feel as though they have a stake in what goes on here. So for us, the level of accountability is, is extremely high, but at the same time, that creates a lot of interesting opportunities around collaboration. Um, it allows us to really think about programming. So when developing social practice, this kind of social practice, um, uh, artist residencies and curatorial fellowships. So engaging artists and curators that are, that are foregrounding the work and the perspectives of, uh, perspectives of community members in their work at the beginning, not as a tack on at the end and saying, you know what, if you wanna work with us as an organization, these are the kind of, this is the, the method or this is the approach that we're looking to support with our artists and our, and our curators. So it's definitely having an impact on the institution, the kind of work that we present um, or will present. And it's a shift, you know, it's, it's a shift for us because we really haven't, we've worked with socially engaged artists, but we're being much more deliberate about it moving forward. So that's interesting. Um, that'll, that'll influence the kind of residency, residency we have, visual artists, installations, um, you know, theater, theater kind of work. So the artists as well as, as well as from a curatorial perspective. So for us, I mean, we're, we're trying to um, just, just lean into and embrace the moment. And I think, think, I think in, in nuanced ways about what social what social um, change means and what role cultural institutions can play in that, and how activists can institutions be um, you know, when, when there are definitely material resources um, you know, up for play and up for grabs. But um, yeah, I mean that's all I say right now. I think that um, it's been interesting. I think for us as as a as an institution. You know, we, we've been involved in any numbers. We're often called on to help frame discussions about diversity and equity in the arts. And I'm thinking, I'm, try, I'm just trying to figure out if this is a moment, what is the window on this kind of work? How long will it last? And how long will people um, be looking to cultural institutions to be more activists, to be more socially engaged, um, you know, to be more on the ground? I feel as though as an organization, we, we turned that corner a while ago and we can't go back, but I'm interested, I'm interested as a field, um, you know, what this means. And I'm also interested in kind of what this next sort of cohort or generation of curators and, and artists whose work is very much engaged in social practice and people that are in, interested in working with communities, um, really what that leads and how that change, changes the field moving forward. Um, it does feel like we've, we've crossed the threshold so for me, I'm trying to think about how Weeksville as an institution can be there to be able to accommodate some of that work, support some of that work, present some of that work, whether it be visual art, exhibits, curatorially, um, and also from a public engagement, um, public discourse perspective. So um, 
for me, um, the work and the time is very exciting. And I, I look forward to your questions, that, any questions you might have. So thank you. Thank you so much. We will now turn to Dr. Davis. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I am actually a little under the weather. Uh, so if I start coughing, just bear with me. Um, like Raymond, I too am on Lenape land um, and in the midst of um, the bones and memories of people of African descent, um, enslaved builders of various parts of what we now call New York City. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be in conversation with you all today. Um, I'm really glad to see people, some people who I haven't seen in a really long time. Um, <clears throat> I wanna, I'm just gonna try to reflect on um, in particular uh, the what's come out of the book that I wrote. Um, prior to writing this book, Reproductive Injustice, Racism, Pregnancy and Premature Birth, all of the research projects that I worked on um, had some kind of social justice component to it. Um, and, and a good reason for that is because I was trained by and uh, was friends with Leith Mullings. Um, and the question was always, you know, what's the purpose of the work you do? <clears throat> it became a little bit harder as I was writing Reproductive Justice um, but it turns out that it wasn't as hard as I would have thought. I couldn't quite imagine how the capturing of stories, birth stories of, of Black birthing people, in particular Black women, might be useful to the reproductive justice movement, which is what I've been a part of for, um, yeah, it's hard to believe, but going on 35 years. Um, but, you know, as I was trying to collectively, as I was trying to imagine and speculate on um, on ideas of activism, um, it was my hope that the issues that I was concerned about would reach broader publics um, and that the kind of publics that I was able to reach would be able to help solidify um, reproductive justice networks. <clears throat> um, so, um, the, the, the activist and advocacy possibilities, I think of writing about black maternal and infant health in the face of like mounting discontent and disarray and disenchantment with the medical complex, the medical technological complex is particularly salient um, when one is talking about reproduction, race and racism because the news around the, that sort of triumvirate is replete with bad news, right? Um, if you pay attention to the statistics, right? There's no happy ending in sight, it seems. Um, sort of what hovers over reproduction and the issues that I investigate, <coughs> excuse me, are really alarming stories, right? Professionals like Shalon Irving, who is the black epidemiologist um, who died uh, as a result of preeclampsia or high blood pressure after the birth of her child, or Kira Johnson, who out, was out in California, um, who was the daughter-in-law of TV judge Glenda Hatchett. Um, re uh, like really a well-resourced black women are, were dying right after childbirth and their deaths have been calculated such that, you know, like they're among the, Black women in particular who are three to four times more likely to die within the first year of giving birth than white women in the United States. So being in the United States and being Black is really very dangerous for birthing people. And I just want to note that, <coughs> excuse me, the focus on, in the book, I focus on women who have um, higher degrees of education, who have access to resources, which can be broadly defined. The fact that I focus on them does, is not intended to overshadow the fact that low income and poor black women bear a heavy, if not the heaviest load of adverse birth outcomes. 
But the point is to build on the work of Leith Mullings and Alaku Wali, who does many things in addition to working at the um, Field Museum, uh, and the brilliant Dorothy Roberts. And their work says that race and racism are instantiated in reproductive crises, not only class. Um, but the work that I focused on in the book had to do with premature births. And I wasn't trying to figure out what caused premature births per se. I was more trying to figure out what was the medical experience of black birthing people whose children were born prematurely or who had a congenital illness and ended up in a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and just for a little, you know, data determinism, um, the rate of preterm pre birth in the United States for black birthing people is about 14%. Um, for the general population, it's about nine. Um, and the March of Dimes in a couple of, in about two weeks is going to identify a new report of how preterm births are, how we're faring in the US. Um, and the reason preterm births are so important is because it is through a preterm birth that um, as a result of a preterm birth, that is actually what leads to the highest degree of infant mortality. Um, but <clears throat> in the face of those kinds of statistics, I wanted to examine how Black women's experienced the medical institutions. And so I did that with 50 parents, nurses, birth advocates, doulas, midwives, doctors, March of Dimes administrators. And what I did was I collected birth stories. And in the book, I describe all of these experiences that hinged on examples of racism. And I laid the foundation for what I now call obstetric racism. And obstetric racism sits is a framework that I developed that sits at the intersection of medical racism, which is actually a legal term in um, places like Venezuela. Uh, and, um, I'm sorry, it, it sits at the, at the intersection of medical racism and obstetric violence, and obstetric violence is a legal term. And it's used to explain different forms of abuse that medical personnel and institutions perpetrate against women during conception, pregnancies, childbirth, and after they've given birth. And I argue that obstetric racism is enacted on racialized bodies and in particular that those bodies have already experienced history, historically constituted forms of subjugation. So um, black bodies in the United States have been experimented upon, experienced uh, um, sterilization, experienced black enslaved black women, for example, were the fodder for the development of C-sections, were the fodder for the development of some of the of dealing with something called vesco-vaginal fistula, and I can answer what that is during the Q and A. Um, but I guess predictably, um, but not what I originally thought would happen, the public that this research and this framework was reaching is our medical professionals. Um, so let me just share really briefly some of the ways in which people have been engaged with these birth stories and the way that I've collected data. So one, and some things were reported back to me and some things I'm involved in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing that was reported back to me is that in New York City, um, I learned that there's a group of nurses at a very well-resourced hospital in, in New York City that are using the birth stories as part of a sort of self-directed consciousness raising session. And what they're doing is they're mining the birth stories to help them document the subtle and blatant ways that racism is articulated in the labor and delivery room and in the NICU. So apparently this group has created a log of all of the instances of racism and other forms of oppression that they've witnessed or encounter. And supposedly the plan is going to be to present this information 
at the nurses meetings and ultimately at the unit meetings so that doctors and others can know what ways racism is being articulated and experienced in this hospital setting. Another thing that um, I'm doing is working with Karen Scott, who's from California, originally out of California, um, UCSF. Um, and she's an OBGYN and an epidemiologist. And what she did was she took obstetric racism, the framework that I developed, and she then translated it into what is now the only validated measure of what's called a patient reported experience measure. If anybody's been in a hospital, when you fill out those um, experience forms at the end, that's a patient reported experience measure. She created one that was by black women rooted in a black woman's framework, mine, that was developed by her as a black woman for black women to help hospitals understand the breadth of racism um, in their institutions. And then to take that data and develop quality improvement plans that then can engage in quality implementation. And the project is really about ending obstetric racism and to transform the care that Black birthing people experience in hospital settings. This is pretty major. Um, we've actually trained what's called the Mountain Area Health Network, which is all of the regions of the state of North Carolina who deal with maternal and uh, infant mortality. We've trained Mississippi, um, and there's plans to train the state of Florida, um, St. Louis, Missouri, Washington, and, Illa and hospitals in Illinois, and at least one in California. Um, and then finally, um, I'm fortunate to work with um, Elizabeth Chin, another anthropologist who's at the Art Center College of Design. And I'm working with the Art College, the Art Center College of Design students in Pasadena. They're using information from the book to develop a range of public facing um, materials. So they're actually meeting today. And the things that they're working on include developing basic pregnancy information flashcards that people can use so they can understand terms, developing animations of birth narratives that can be used by birth centers and, and childbirth educators who can help unpack the kinds of issues and questions that Black women and Black birthing people in particular have with medical providers. Um, and they're also developing palm cards with not pregnancy related terms, but terms that um, deal with um, the kinds of uh, technology that people come into contact with that they don't always understand when somebody says, you know, we're gonna put your infant on a CPAP, like what's a CPAP? Continuous positive airway, right? So those are the kinds of um, projects that I'm working on and working in consultation with people. Um, and just to say that I'll also be using some of this material and this information to um, in the, in the community-based work that I do. Um, in addition to doing, a re doing research, I'm also a doula. So I have a practice. Sure. A but, Somebody said something. Um, and so as a doula, I'll also be able to use these materials in dealing with the people that I work with who are generally low income and plan to share them with other institutions, um, birth centers, childbirth educators who are dealing predominantly with black populations, but not only. So that's where we are. Thank you so much. I might suggest that we're at a good moment where if you are realizing that you have questions for our speakers, you could be adding those to the chat. Uh, we will now turn to Dr. Gill. 
Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, I must um, confess that uh, until now, I've never looked up, you know, where Washington DC is. <laughs> I, I actually live in Washington DC in Capitol Hill. So this land actually originally belonged to the Nakotchtank people, um, which is after also, um, uh, they're also known um, with another name, Anacostians, which is the river that's very close to my house where I go running <laughs> every, every morning, the Anacostia River in Washington, D.C. Um, so let me just, um, uh, and also my um, preferred gender pronouns is he, him. And so let me begin with um, my presentation. So just hang on one second. Um, thank you for inviting me again to be part of this conversation and uh, please let me know when I'm hitting my um, my time limit here and um, unfortunately when I go into my keynote mode um, I can't see the chats so um, uh, just interrupt me um, um, you know and uh, so I want to begin by talking a little bit about my research so my work is um, looks at media, masculinity, and transnationality in Northern India. Um, I got my PhD at American University. I got started in anthropology at uh, San Francisco State University, which is where I got my BA in anthropology. And um, so it's wonderful to, to be back um, there, at least virtually. Um, my research is in Punjab region of, um, of India. Uh, in northern India, and um, I've been doing work there since 2009. Um, and in fact, uh, there are these these two pictures that you see of me. One was taken in 2009 when I had first started field work, and the last one was taken in 2020, um, uh, uh, just after um, you know the pandemic hit, and I had to like pack up all my stuff and come back. I was there on a sabbatical, um, doing uh, doing ethnographic film and research. So. Broadly, my work um, explores um, the concept of what it means to be a man in Punjabi or Indian society. Um, you know, this region is uh, predominantly um, very patriarchal, patrilineal. Um, it's also um, mostly rural or agricultural. Um, if you've been paying attention at all to what's happening in India over the past two Two years or three years, you probably have seen the the farmers movement that's happening there, and majority of the the farmers that are part of this um, the the movement against the government that's trying to impose certain laws, new laws that is really going to affect uh, farming in and particularly small scale agriculture in a very negative way. A lot of those farmers are from Punjab, and um, so Punjab is a is a as I said a very patriarchal society. Men are, you know, in positions of power vis-a-vis -vis women and other sexual minorities. But you know, I sort of talk about this my understanding of um, Punjabi culture and Punjab as this macho land or Mardistan, as where uh, you know a lot of men are also limited um, their their choices and the decisions that they can make and you know um, how they can live their lives and what kind of identities they can take on or whether, you know, um, who they can marry and, you know, what their families are going to be like is also determined by those kind of patriarchal structures in which they, um, um, they exist. So I sort of interrogate that critically in a lot of my research and work. And I, so I should also um, emphasize that, um, I should also add that actually I'm from Punjab originally, I was born in India. So part of my work looks is really uh, geared towards working with within communities where I actually grew up. So um, the way in which um, my research um, um, sort of the outcome of my research is uh, ethnographic film. Um, for me, my ethnographic film is a form of advocacy and has been a form of advocacy for me from the very beginning since I started in anthropology and even as a as a undergraduate at San Francisco State University. And over the past, um, you know, um, over the past um, 10 years, I guess now, uh, I've made three docu ethnographic documentary films 
Um, and one examining a masculinity in the context of religious representation, um, another one that looks at a sexual violence and pervasiveness of sexual violence against women and sexual minorities in Punjab, um, as well as uh, the issues related to uh, sex, selection, sex selective abortions and the sun preference. Uh, Punjab is also unfortunately one of those places that in India where has the, the worst male to female sex ratios to a large part now because of sex selective abortions. And so it sort of interrogates, um, the second film interrogates masculinity in a kind of critical way. And the third film, um, Sent Away Boys, which came out in 2016, is a film that um, looks at why, you, despite Punjab being a society where men are privileged and, you know, um, you know they, they enjoy the kind of benefits of male supremacy, uh, why do they want to leave Punjab, right? Um, and then part of that has to do with the kind of agricultural, the the the, the long um, ongoing kind of collapse of agriculture in this particular region, and uh, and the the kind of agrarian collapse that has happened over the past 20, 30 years since the Green Revolution and the effects of the Green Revolution. But also part of that is also um, this kind of the limitations that as, as I was talking about the limitations that. Um, caste and class imposes on people in terms of what kind of lives they can live, what kind of profession they can have. And, um, you know, migration or transnational migration offers up more opportunities to be able to kind of circumvent some of those, those limitations. So that, that film particularly looks at that. Uh, and then one part of that is also looks at um, kind of growing um, issues uh, um, with drug addiction in this particular region, you know, um, where a lot of young men who don't do farming um, end up turning to pharmaceutical drugs and end up abusing them, which are very widely available. So um, my current project, which I actually had started in 2019, when I started my, my field, uh, my um, sabbatical, uh, uses a virtual reality. It's a series of virtual reality videos and uses virtual reality as a way of engaging um, young men, particularly in Punjab and other parts of um, uh, other parts of Northern India in conversations around gender and sexuality. So I should also go back and say that um, all three of my films, um, even though they're informed by ethnographic and anthropological research, they were made for um, national television in India. It was really important for me that they speak to the audiences uh, in India and to my interlocutors and reflect their own experience in their lives. Um, so they were first and foremost, uh, first and foremost shown on national TV in India, and they're currently being used in um, academic and um, sort of school curriculums around uh, gender and sexual education, um, which in India is very lacking in that area in terms of comprehensive sex education. So a lot of universities in Northern India have sort of incorporated these films into conversations around gender equity and um, sexual minority rights, as well as NGOs that have done that. So it was really important for me to make these films also available. Um, you know, they're on YouTube, they're um, on, uh, on Vimeo for streaming. So anybody can watch it and make them as accessible as possible. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about also what what it's what it means to be in academia and produce ethnographic research and scholarship that might not necessarily fit into the kind of traditional definition of what 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 scholar scholarship should be for the purposes of tenure and promotion, um, and, you know, and is geared towards more kind of wider audience. And fortunately, I'm at a university where. I've been I've been very much supported in in being able to do that um, and in the form of film. So my next project, which I'm currently working on, uh, which I started um, uh, funded by uh, Fulbright, is a virtual reality project that uses um, I use virtual reality immersive virtual reality as a way of kind of creating um, short narratives that allows people to not just view something on screen, but also really experience a particular place in the story. And I find it to be our, it's a new medium of engagement. It's a new, um, it's, it's quite promising, but also there's lots of limitations as well in terms of VR. So I just begin filming in March of last year, 
um, as actually I was supposed to start filming in April of last year. And, you know, uh, while I was in India, uh, the Fulbright uh, uh, office called me and they said, okay, you need to pack up all your bags and um, go back to the US because, the, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So all my, <laughs> my, my equipment and everything is still in India. I'm hoping to be able to go back next year and be able to continue doing this work but I haven't really been able to film a ton of material as of yet, but um, it is something that I'm really excited about. And the idea of using VR as a way of kind of engaging um, particularly young people around this theme of, of, of gender and sexuality came to me um, thinking about the idea of the bioscope, which is the kind of um, uh, this old school technology in India that, uh, you know, where that's very common, that was, very common in particularly in rural Indias where there was no cinemas. So you could look into this, this, um, this thing, this box in which you could watch like a five minute video or film. And usually it was a film, a Bollywood film sliced down to five minutes. And because uh, India has some of the sort of cheapest rates in terms of um, uh, mobile data. And um, so it, it, it makes sense to use a kind of a, a virtual medium that's very accessible to mobile technology and to be able to do that and, and circulate it widely and make it available for ver to various NGOs in their workshops and seminars and get people to talk about issues of sexual violence, about power and consent um, and, and gender sexuality as well. Um, I wanna go back quickly and um, talk uh, very briefly about um, my sort of background before um, starting my fieldwork research and before starting my doctoral program at um, uh, American University. I actually uh, uh, lived in San Francisco, as I said, um, and I really learned ethnographic film, or actually I learned filmmaking in San Francisco, um, partly in uh, Dr. Biella's class, uh, Peter Biella's class, uh, as part of the visual anthropology program, but also um, through a lot of engagement with nonprofits within San Francisco. Um, there was a project in 2004, which I was a part of called uh, Mission Movie, which was a bilingual kind of an ethno fiction film that a community came together, a, a, a group of us came together and worked in the Mission District of San Francisco and um, collected these stories in a really um, um, exciting way and created a script and made a film. And the film was actually shown at Cell Space, which is a, 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 a nonprofit space in San Francisco, which no longer exists, unfortunately. You know, and it really uh, the the film itself documents a community in the process of transitioning, and also the effects of gent gentrification and displacement on on communities. Um, you know, in in cities like San Francisco and you know other places as well. Uh, so that was a really exciting experience that I learned so much from that, that experience. And um, also the potential for film to be able to really give a group of people or a community of people a voice, you know, and be able to, you know, record their narratives and um, have themselves reflected in, in, a, in film. And so that was really exciting, um, you know, um, even though, you know, unfortunately, ambition is no longer what it used to be. Uh, 15 years ago when we made the film. So um, uh, after that, I worked on a project, um, you know, uh, so prior to um, studying masculinity and gender in India, I was really uh, motivated by questions around sexual identity and sexual minority rights, uh, particularly, again, owing a lot to my time in San Francisco and being sort of motivated by the kind of activism and or the various NGOs that were there. And one of the organizations that really supported me and nurtured my work was Frameline, which is a, a, a distribution company, but also an NGO based in San Francisco. And they work with um, LGBTQ um, youth particularly and really nurture their work. And so one of the documentaries that I made, which is actually still being um, distributed by Frameline, middle and someone made me gay, explore, explores these themes of um, sexual identity, belonging, racism within um, the queer community, um, these sort of, and as well as um, homophobia within South Asian community, diaspora community in this film, uh, which came out in 2007. 
And I'm currently working on a book, uh, the title Coming of Age in Macho Land, and I'm hoping that to finish it next year and it'll be out soon. And again, I'm trying to write it in a way in which that it, it's most accessible to uh, audiences outside of academia and, um, uh, and, and sort of, and also the, the kind of title is an homage to Margaret Mead's uh, book coming of age in Samoa, which is written in that style, um, in a sort of non-academic style. So that's the next project. And I think I'm pretty much out of time, but I'll just say that um, you can head to my website, uh, which is harjongill.com, and you can check out um, uh, all of my writings as well as my films. You can watch all the films on there um, and use them in your class. And um, you can, there's also links to all my work there. So um, I will end there. Thank you so much for, again, inviting me to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, we have one speaker remaining and as usual, not quite enough time uh, for questions. If our speakers are able to stay on the conversation a little longer for questions, that would be wonderful. But one way or another, we will work this out. Um, please continue putting your questions in the chat. And let's now turn to our final speaker, Dr. Jones. Well, good evening now for us on the East Coast. <laughs> um, I'm seated on the, uh, as, um, located on the unceded territory of the uh, Piscataway people um, and the Susquehanna. So um, I did want to take time to make that kind of land acknowledgement. Um, now that I know we're strapped for time, I, I have a PowerPoint, but I don't want to get too, too into the weeds. So I'm just going to more talk to you and just we'll let it do what it do. Um, I'm, I am an archaeologist. Uh, so Raven, I'm it. I'm, I'm, I'm that different um, that came into play. I'm that thing that they didn't expect um, that showed up on the doorsteps of Berkeley. Um, and by that, I mean, I walked into archaeology and much like a lot of my colleagues of my generation and younger, I was like, well, what is this? Um, so I decided in my advocacy to uh, change and flip and rearrange and revolutionize things um, in the field of archaeology. So within my first year, um, I ended up doing community service. Berkeley had this community service component. Um, you go out and you do community service. I went to a school, I did work. And at the end of it, the teacher said, hey, uh, I'll see you next semester. And when I say it irked me to my nerves, it wasn't the fact that we were coming back. It wasn't the fact we were doing community service. It irked me that this wasn't something that children where I grew up could experience and teachers could make those comments. And so as a result, I went back to Berkeley and I said, I would never do community service in California again. I'll only do it in DC. I'm a native Washingtonian and a child of a mother who worked at the Smithsonian. But I didn't know what archeology span was until I got to uh, Howard University and took my first anthropology course. But I also grew up with a parent who worked at the Smithsonian. So that says a lot about the disconnect of being a child in the public school system, the Catholic school system, the private school system in DC, and this great institution that lords kind of over us in downtown. Uh, with that being said, that began the beginning of my nonprofit. So for all the graduate students in the room, I do not advise you start a nonprofit while writing your dissertation. It is dumb. <laughs> but I did it. Um, and I started an organization called Archaeology in the Community. And it's an archaeology education nonprofit. Um, and it was two things. It was my, I'm breaking the glass ceiling. I'm not going to operate in the same paradigm. I'm not, I'm going to kind of create what I want to create and how I want to create it in a way that I know is effective without having anybody dictator tell me what to do. Um, and so when I initially started it, the first, um, uh, our, our, why can't I not think of it? Our first programmatic uh, level, and it'll come to me in a second, I don't know why I'm blanking, was basically, um, we're gonna teach children. So all throughout uh, DC, Maryland and Virginia, I started free archeology span programs. Uh, the first few were paid by uh, or paid for by Berkeley because as a graduate student, we got funds for doing outreach. Um, and then I started raising funds and it took off. 
And it was such a high demand and everybody wanted it. What started to happen is as I came up in the field, I also saw inequalities and inequities for graduate students. Like we have no money, but firms, uh, CRM firms, archeology span firms, institutions expect you to have all this training, but nobody wants to pay for it. So I started the professional development arm and I basically made it a free for all. We had resume writing, we had come and learn how to use a total station. And I was charging disrespectfully low rates, like $10 come get this training, like, come, whatever you need, let me know if there's something you need, I can find an archaeologist who can host the course for you. Um, we're a nonprofit, I can offer it as a write off to the archaeologist. So I, I, this started to kind of grow. We do um, archaeology education, which is my main thing. There was at the time nowhere where graduate students can go and actually get trained on how to talk to teach and run an in-classroom program for youth, except for universities were always in the mount and universities were always having problems and issues where the kids were acting crazy because people didn't learn about classroom management. Uh, they didn't learn what's appropriate and not appropriate. They don't know how to talk to children, to use vocabulary and terminology. So we ended up being almost a clearinghouse for how to educate folks on how to teach and do archeology span education. Well, then last but not least, what we started to notice is we had all these cool adults who were like, well, we want to learn about archaeology, too. So our, our third initiative just became our community archaeology component. Um, and that has grown and developed into all types of things I never expected. Um, so we run a festival. And for the past 11 years, we've had a day of archaeology festival, um, the only one of its kind in the country where we bring archaeologists in face painters, music. I mean, it's a for real festival, but with all archaeology. So we created that. We started throwing programs because we realized that adults like to drink. We have all types of programs with alcohol. So we have the archaeology of mixology. You learn about stemware and glassware, and there's a mixologist making the custom drink that goes with the glass. So it was kind of these fun, funky ways because I kept hearing archaeologists say, nobody cares about us. We're losing money. Nobody's voting. Um, all of these other things. And I kept saying, well, unless you go to the people, the people are not going to care anymore. So it was kind of my kind of love letter to the field of archaeology and how do I change it and how do I create it um, and make it something that is sustainable, but that also makes an impact and also changes the lives of people. And also um, the biggest thing is that right now, especially Post George Floyd, we keep hearing about diversity and equity and you know all of these wonderful buzz terms, but my thing is like, what are people doing? So it also became a way for me to show youth who grow up in my neighborhoods that there's a scientist who looks just like you, who's cool as you, you know, who's also doing uh, this hard thing and doing these. So this just became one avenue of advocacy, but in it, we've expanded outside of the Mid-Atlantic. I've worked internationally in Haiti, where I've taught a whole village of youth um, archeology span education. Um, I have an ongoing project in St. Croix for the past five years, where I run an archeological field school for high school students in conjunction with the Caribbean Girls and Boys Club. I've partnered with the Smithsonian on the Africa town, and I'm starting a new uh, field school for high school students there. I've worked in Belize for three years with the Institute of Archaeology in Belize and for three years traveled around with Niche to train children in Belize about cultural heritage preservation. I, in addition to that, talk to police, uh, customs, and business owners to talk about what community archaeology looks like and engagement and how we can all support heritage preservation in the Belizean context. Um, and that's just under the company. So when we talk about these careers, the other thing is that's one hat that I wear, which sounds like a lot, right? But I'm gonna have to get way worse. Um, the other thing is my own personal research, my own personal experiences in the field. So I've looked at um, what are some of the issues that we have as black archeologists and are experiencing. So we created a film last year called Black in the um, Field of Archeology. span And I basically interviewed 
Black archaeologists so they could talk about their pain, their trauma, their PTSD that they've experienced and how all of us are experiencing in this field so that as we move forward, people could actually see what some of your colleagues are going through. I have a chapter of a book looking um, called The Only Sin, um, Our Only Sin Was Being Black, which looks at the history of Black archaeologists from um, all the way back to Thomas Jefferson up until today, looking at African Americans in the field of archaeology and how we've basically been erased from the story of, but have done so much archaeological work throughout the years and don't get credit for it, and utilizing photographs, photography to tell that story. Um, I have since gone on um, because I'm, I'm a very big believer in as academics. We tend to be neo-colonialists. We go into communities, we do work, we write publications, and we leave, and we don't give anything back. Uh, so my dissertation site that I did on an African-American cemetery, um, they basically tapped me because the state of Maryland was trying to run through the, our cemetery. And I came back on a volunteer basis, and I'm now a trustee for that cemetery, and I'm doing archaeology advocacy to fight the actual state and state archaeologists, which is funny that it's my own colleagues I'm fa fighting, in order to have justice done for this cemetery and help preserve um, African American cemeteries. In addition to that, with my St. Croix work and in the Caribbean, um, I'm also on a um, heritage commission for St. Eustatius and looking at what's being done. I'm in the process of writing new policy that we're hoping will be adopted by all of the Caribbean on how to do ethical uh, archaeology and community archaeology where it's engaged with the community of indigenous and black people uh, within the Caribbean um, and how uh, transformative when you actually do community archaeology, it can be for our field and how much more um, we do. And last but not least, I'm on the Historic Preservation Board uh, for Washington, D.C. So also in my own neighborhood and in my own community that I was born and raised, do the work of making sure um, our heritage is preserved and that due diligence is being done as well in the community. So with all of that, um, basically, you can do anything you want to do with this degree. Um, and I, I tell my students this all the time, anything you can imagine you can do with an anthropology degree. If you wanna change the world, you can change the world. There is no glass ceiling, there is no limit. The only limit is what you put on yourself. Um, and hence, I've tried my best um, to make sure the hours, minutes, and days that I have on this earth that I am impacting everybody from the youngest child to the oldest person um, with my superpower, which is archeology. span Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. That is a wonderful note for us to be closing on with our panelists' remarks that you can do anything you want to do with this degree. That is true. Um, I don't know if panelists were able to follow along in the chat, but there's so much enthusiasm and appreciation shared by our students. And I just wanna borrow Ashley's comment to Dr. Jones from a moment ago that you are wildly inspiring. I would like to spread that out to all of our panelists today. Your work is wildly inspiring. And I know our students so appreciated and are so inspired by the creativity, the power and the beauty of your projects and your bigger programs beyond your scholarly work um, that is grounded in that social justice vision. Um, so remarkable. I know that it is 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. for our panelists. And so in respect of your time, I would suggest that we will do questions and answers for 10 moments. And then if folks need to excuse themselves, that of course will be understood. But if you are able to hang on and address more and continue to discuss, we'll be so grateful. So we have comments in the chat. And the one that I wanna take us to first is from Talia Brass. Talia, would, like, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Uh, thank you all so very much for being here. I feel, I speak for everyone, I'm sure, feeling so lucky to be able to hear a little bit about your work and be able to ask you questions. Um, let me see, where is my question here? Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, yes. So Raymond mentioned being aware of whether people in the neighborhood where he works see themselves represented in what he and his colleagues are doing. So my question is for all the speakers, 
um, as an academic, how have you been received by the families, individuals and cultural groups um, that you are aiming to support? Um, and how do you build trust? How do you build rapport? Um, you know, you, you have a vision, you have an idea, like Dr. Jones, you're saying you had these incredible plans to, to make your nonprofit um, that have come true, but how do you uh, impart that uh, in a positive way to the community that you want to work with? Um, and then if uh, we probably don't have time to get into examples, but that's just something I'm interested in knowing. Who wants? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in because I'll be quick. Um, it's, an on, it's an ongoing process. Some people, I mean, I don't know. I think that in, in some instances, in, 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 at least in the context of cultural institutions, so people think you cross a threshold and you're there and everything happens and then, you know, balloons go off and everybody loves you. This isn't, no, this doesn't really happen like that. It's, um, it's a constant relation, set of relationship building exercises. Um, some of it is literal, some of it is figurative. figurative. Um, everything from opening the doors, offering space grants. Hey, Wednesday nights, come in, here's space for you, can have this conversation. We'll market this for you, we'll get people here for you. Um, it's developing particular kinds of program programming, whether it be visual art where people can actually see themselves. It's going um, across the street to public housing and meeting people. It is um, shaking hands, walking in the neighborhood, being where folks are, being seen. So um, it's, it's a range of activities. It's everything from programming to hand to hand, handshaking, um, and uh, being open to criticism. And being able to channel that constructively into the next step about how do you avoid being in the same situation again. John, I see I you raised your hand. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. No, did did someone have their hand up? I'm sorry. Okay, I would say put in that work. It's just that simple. I mean, literally, like for me, I go to community cleanup days. Like I help my community. It's the same thing within the St. Croix community. Even though I come down one summer, um, during the summer only to train for um, uh, the kids, I come and then I have a pizza party once a year. I also, when hurricanes hit, I put together a huge drive for the VI in DC to send stuff back and we sent it directly to our partners in the project. The idea is put that work in. If you're doing community work, be a part of the community. Don't only be there when it's good for you. Um, so I'll just add to that a little bit. And, you know, part of it is that the communities where I work are communities, um, you know, uh, particularly in Punjab, these are, um, this is a community where I come from, right? And and I know people there and I've known the people there for, for a long periods of time. And they hold me accountable if I, <laughs> you know, if I, if I don't um, represent them in, in a way that they want to be represented. And they think more important than anything else, it's really important for them to be able to see themselves reflected in the, the stories that I document and I produce. And one way in which, um, you know, I, my commitment to that is by making the film that, it, that they can watch, right? Or even in terms of writing, and I haven't done a ton of writing with my ethnographic research, um, but making films that they can watch and they have a copy of and they can easily access. Um, is really important, and I and I feel like a lot of times in anthropology, um, there, are in uh, no disrespect to to folks who are doing this, but there are a lot of brilliant scholars who do really brilliant work around the world, but their scholarship doesn't really um, sort of translate or um, it really uh, resonate in a way in which it their interlocutor can see themselves being reflected, their lives are being reflected. And for me, it's really, really important that my films end up being something that they can, they have sense of ownership over, right? That they're they're part of this, this collaborative process. And so that that's part of the reason why, and, and that sometimes has its, um, you know, um, its shortcomings as well, because um, for, for me, when I made my films, I had the choice of making a very academic documentary film and releasing it with somebody like uh, uh, DER, the Documentary Educational Resources, or a company that's going to make it available only on Canopy or online 
you know, for $300 per like educational screening. And I deliberately made the choice to not go that route. And uh, so you forego certain, certain forms of kind of um, uh, uh, sort of validation that you would get from kind of academic circles uh, by making your work more accessible. And, I, and that's, a, that's a choice that I'm willing to make. Um, one of the things that I would just like to point out is um, the degree to which we're very um, English centric often in our work. And one of the problems, it's an interesting problem, I think, but it is a problem uh, in the academy when we can't easily access funds to get work translated into other languages. And I recently had an experience during the time of COVID where somebody wanted to translate my uh, uh, an article on obstetric racism into Portuguese and the publisher wanted to charge them like, I don't know, $4,000. And I wrote and I was really quite flummoxed. I said, this is actually something that's really important. It's being used by doulas in, in Bahia um, to try to get a handle on a, a particular kind of organizing strategy. And I think it's inappropriate for you to be capitalizing, and I use the term racial capitalizing, racial capital, um, that actually will prevent the dissemination of information, right? And so I'm just saying that um, we need to always be thinking about the multitude of ways in which we can share our work in community um, and not only be thinking about English, not only be thinking about, I mean, I know, you know, Harjan, I know what you do. And I, you know, I just finished participating in this amazing anti-eugenics program where about, I don't know, about a fifth of the audience couldn't see, right? They, they, they were visually impaired. And we need to, you know, so my point simply is opening up the scope of how we engage and actually talking with and communicating and having relationships with different publics that are also differently abled. So I feel like I may be, uh, I guess I'm not geographically furthest. I'm among the more geographically far from the people that I, I work directly to document their struggles. Um, and one of the most invaluable experiences that I had was being able to go back and present my work in this like community dialogue structure um, where I was kind of um, put out things that for what was then an in-process book saying, here's what I think is going on. Can we have a like big go round where you tell me what resonates with you? What do you think is what right and what is wrong about the representation? Um, and it was a really like amazing format. I, I was, grateful for how it turned out. And I was really inspired by this group called Colectivo Situaciones in uh, Buenos Aires, which does the same. They actually, all of their publications or many of their publications have this, like our interpretive thesis, then a series of interviews with the people that we wrote the thesis about, and then um, a kind of collective conclusion. Um, and I did not go that far um, because travel, kids, et cetera. Uh, but um, I, I was able to um, leverage some support both for that and for translating my book. Um, and so like, um, you know, we're all in this like CV race as at, if you're in the academy. Um, and so if you can find the ways to have the thing that you did, <laughs> um, even if it's a little bit of money, it's a, a CV item that says like, I paid a translator out of this process or I traveled and did this engagement um, to really like foreground those things um, and make them part of your career, I think is important. Thank you. Um, mindful of the time, I might suggest that we could close here and let everybody have their Friday evening, understanding that there are many more questions that we would ideally like to share with our wonderfully accomplished panelists. So apologies for having to cut short, but I think we learned so much and we are so, so, so appreciative for the opportunity to learn from you. Can everybody maybe unmute and applaud or send reactions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank you.
Happy Halloween. Uh, have a great weekend. <laughs> yes, you too. Take care and be safe. Good night, everyone. For you Good online. Night. Thank you. Oh, that was great. Thank you for watching with me. It's wonderful fun. Yeah. Oh, Cindy, you're in the department no, of watch party in the oh, other department no, no. No. we watch together oh that's so nice to see wow <laughs> yeah it was oh that's so cool to see <laughs> what an amazing webinar dr lincoln thank you for putting that together thanks yeah. to our amazing guests yeah. amazing guests so, so much, much appreciation. So much. I can't wait to join the ranks of uh, activist anthropologists <laughs> someday. Yeah, we got a lot of um, important clues about next steps. So really, really grateful. Carwell, so glad you could be with us. Thank you so much. I know that you Thank have you. lots of other stuff happening right now. So happy to be here. Um, yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care. Be safe. See you in, um, see you in Baltimore. Dr. Thank Fisher, you. will you be in Baltimore? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> <Allah>. <laughs> um, hopefully. Um, so, um, and yes, I was going to share if they.